Welcome and good evening, everybody. My name is Corinne DeBray, and I'm the managing director at The Foster. So tonight, I'm very pleased to introduce our guest artist explorer, speakers, plural. When we first started this series, I was very interested in giving an opportunity for a young artist explorer, or maybe even a small panel of young artist explorers, to talk about maybe personal research projects that they might be engaged in. Happily, we met a wonderful young woman, Fiona, who's sitting right here, who has spent um, an, an extensive time out in the field exploring and recording her observations in nature um, in a series of nature journals for the past few years, resulting in about, and I held this up before, about a thousand pages of journal um, of illustrations out in the field, which she'll talk about in a few minutes. She'll share some of her work this evening, and then we'll switch to an in-conversation format with John Muir Laws, an author, naturalist, teacher, and all-around amazing person, and true artist explorer who presented here at the Foster in July of this year. And his video of his presentation is also on YouTube. Uh, so I'm very excited to have them both here this evening. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Fiona and Jack. Thank you so much, everyone. I just want to start by saying thank you so much to the Foster. Thank you so much to Corinne, all of the staff here. You guys are so wonderful. Thank you so much. I feel so honored to be part of this series. Um, so I'm 15 years old. I'm not necessarily what you would call your, quote, typical teenager. I don't really have a cell phone, don't really want one, don't watch TV, and I really rarely use a computer. Um, so I love art, love drawing ever since I could hold a crayon. I love to make things as well, so knitting, sewing, gluing, crafting, all of that I love. Um, also performing arts, so another kind of branch of art, so acting, singing. I'm in professional theater in Sacramento, so on and so forth. So I also really, really love nature. So I am very blessed to live very near a river, um, the, the American River, and so we walk down there a lot. Um, there's beautiful trails. That's kind of the site for a lot of my journals. We will pretty much go out no matter the weather. So there's me in the rain drawing a flower. Um, and so we, we basically, we go out if it's um, super hot and we can only like go out a little bit and draw or we go out if it's raining, it really kind of doesn't matter. Um, but we, we, we love to go out in nature all the time. Uh, so when I, when I met Jack, John Muir Laws, I, and I learned about nature journaling, I realized that it takes art and it takes nature and it puts them together. And that's a really fun thing and it's super fun to put two things I love together. So a lot of people ask me why I journal. Um, and it's mainly because it's just super fun. I love it so much. And it happens in nature, again, which is a place I love. And also journaling is extremely freeing. It's not about the pretty pictures, it's about the pencil miles. So the more you sketch, the better you will eventually get. But don't focus on the pretty picture, don't focus on the final product, focus on the process getting there. And also, I have a very strong self-critic that sits on my shoulder and tells me I am horrible at everything. And for some reason, in journaling, my self-critic goes away. I don't know why this is, but my self-critic is not present in journaling, so it's really nice to have a break from my self-critic, from all of that. And also, I ask a lot of questions. You will see later in some of my pages, I ask just questions upon questions upon questions. And a lot of people are like, why don't you answer them all? And I'm kind of like, because I don't really want to. Like, if I eventually find the answer, great, but I'm not going to go on Google and Google every single question that I ask. So it's also super freeing. I can write as many questions as I want, and I don't need to worry about, I need to get the answers to all of these. And so I have journaled for more than a thousand pages, as is this large stack of journals, um, in a little over two years, which is about how long I've been journaling. And people ask me um, why I keep doing it, and it's, again, mainly because it's fun and I want to do it again. And I keep my kit ready by the door. I take it everywhere. Every time I might run into some natural something, I will take my journal with me. I go for a walk almost every day down to the river on these trails. All the time, I'll, I'll take walks. 
and it doesn't really have to take a lot of time. Journaling doesn't have to take a lot of time. If you have an hour and a half, great. If you have 10 minutes, that also works too. You can, you can do a completely successful journal page in 10 minutes. You can do something quickly and just be done with it. Um, and it's, it's super nice to be able to do that because some, I, I've, I've had times where I'm like, well, I only have 10 minutes, so I don't really have time to journal, so I would, just won't do it. But if I get down to it and take out my journal, I will do something in 10 minutes. And also, I, I used to think that you have to go to a special place. You have to go to Yosemite. You have to go to Yellowstone to get inspiration to journal. Um, and then I kind of had this revelation that my backyard works too, um, and that there are really wonderful things in my backyard that I can journal about and continue journaling about for years and years and years. Um, so this, this is my first official journal page that I ever did. Um, so there is a little writing, but notice there is a lot of blank space. Duly note that because it will change. Most of my writing is just observations about the bird, color, color notes, feather notes, kind of stuff like that. And then this one, this is one after a couple weeks of journaling. So again, a lot of white space, a few questions here and there, um, but mostly observations are what I'm writing. Uh, here's some acorns that I did for a while. Again, a lot of white space. Um, very careful drawings as well. This, it's kind of hard to tell, especially from this next one. It's hard to tell from these, but these took me a very long time. I was very painstakingly making sure that all the feathers lined up just right. Um, I had a lot of stuff that went into this that I, I could have done it much quicker now, but I, I spent a lot of time on these early pages. So this is kind of my first journal page that I started measuring things, um, my first bubble question mark. This will evolve more over time. Um, kind of some my first weather notes, my first um, date box, so on and so forth. This was kind of a more revolutionary page at its time. So this is after a year of journaling. So this was watching a little rosebud bloom over time. I literally got to watch it bloom before my eyes. I checked it pretty much every day. And rain or shine, I'd go out with my little umbrella and paint my rose. This was really my first thing that I watched over time, watching the little flowers. So that was super fun. I had a lot of fun doing that. So this is one of my first stories I ever did in my journal. So I was watching a group of kinglets in a tree, watched a cooper's hawk fly over. It flew over the kinglets, and the kinglets had this giant alarm call. Um, and that was super cool to see. So I wrote a ton of questions about it. You can start to see the questions are like encroaching on my art. Um, tons and tons and tons of questions. So this was kind of also my first story in my journal. So here we are again. The questions are everywhere. Um, these, these little things, these wow boxes, um, are like exclamation point plus. So if I'm really excited about something, I'll put a wow box. If, if it's an exclamation point, it's like, oh, that's cool. Wow box is like, whoa, oh my gosh, this is really surprising and fun. Um, so that's kind of the general thing of that. Also, more evolved weather boxes, I call them, so date, weather, and where I am. And here's another one, tons of questions again, um, having fun with titles, that was kind of a fun one that I did with this one. Here's one of my first pages that I drew like multiple different pictures of the same creature. So this was a praying mantis I found on a trail. Um, near my house, and I put it in my hat, and I was watching it, and it was moving around so much, I decided I was going to draw it in about 10 different positions. So I drew it climbing up the side of my hat, I drew it upside down, you know, I, I drew it in all these different positions, that's kind of a first. Um, and color-coded question marks, that's also something that's kind of fun, so having green question marks for a green bug. This is my first, like, official, it's, it's, it's called a joint comparison. Um, and it's basically putting two similar things next to each other, and when you put two similar things next to each other, you see the differences and similarities in them. So something, and also just shout out to Marley um, for, yes, shout out to Marley for introducing me to joint comparisons. Love them, they're wonderful. Um, so this was probably one of my biggest ones. The cool thing I found out about these pine needles is that the ponderosa pine needles and the gray pine needles have the same, are the same color, but they have little tiny dots 
on them. And the ponderosa dots are yellow, and the grape pine needle dots are white. And so from far away, the ponderosa looks like it's brighter, and the grape pine looks like it's duller. So that was kind of cool to see. Here's part two of that comparison. So lots of questions everywhere, color-coded question marks as well. So the brown ones are for the, the, pine co the ponderosa, and then gray ones for the gray pine. So this is fun because it's brown paper. So the fun thing about brown paper is you can put white on brown paper and it really pops. So like for this western goal face, um, you, if, if you were to put that on white paper, it would totally wash out. But when you put it on brown paper, it pops and it's super fun. So I love doing seabirds that are like really contrasty on white paper, on brown paper like this. They're really, really fun. Again, tons of questions. Um, so here's one. I was looking at a field of mist, this certain kind of flower, and this was kind of the innovation of something cool. I had just been introduced to stem leaf plots, and I didn't really understand stem leaf plots. I was really confused by them. I was like, I don't understand how they work. I don't know what to do. So I was like, well, I do want to document the colors, the different colors of this mist. And so I made this little graph. I was like, okay, I'm going to do something like a stem leaf plot. It isn't a stem leaf plot, but that's okay. So I put these little boxes of color down one side and then made a hash mark for each of the flowers that were that color. So then you can pretty much very easily see that the kind of medium blue had the most, the white second, so on and so forth. And so this is kind of a cool innovation called a phonograph, Jack likes to call it. Um, so <laughs> this is a, a, a different color graph that's, that I kind of invented that's kind of fun and then an actual stem leaf plot there. But yeah, anyway, this is really fun because I toned the paper myself. Um, so that's black paint on the paper and then white pen over the top. And I planned out the circles before this lunar eclipse, then got up at four in the morning and drew the moon every like 12 minutes, I think it was, um, and documented how it changed. So the, the end of it is when it was total and then going on until um, it was totally off, and that was a super, super fun thing to work on, and also working in white pen was just also made me really happy. So this is after, so th these are more recent pages. So this one is a super fun assignment that Jack has given me before of, so basically, so the fairies have these plans to build the flowers. Um, and they only know how to build the flowers if they have the plans to build the flowers, right? But the trolls came in and stole the fairies' plans, and so now you have to make new plans for these flowers. So it's this fun little hypothetical that really makes you go in depth and look at all these different aspects of the flower. So like all going into the buds, the leaves, the flowers, the stalk, installation and assembling instructions. So just like all of it, super fun. And then this one is some birds that I literally saw from my own backyard that were migrating through that were crazy fun. And this is also fun with color-coded question marks. So the blue ones for the Lazuli Bunting, the um, yellow ones for the Townsend's Warbler, so on and so forth. And this I started be because my questions had got to the point where there were about four layers of them and you could not read them, I could not read them, so there was a problem, right? So I started working with a thinner pencil and having more air between my questions, and that really helped for a lot of this. So that's, that's something that I started that was new that I started a couple months ago. So this is the first page of a super fun exploration that I did on some flowers that were near a pond where I lived. Um, so I gave each of the flowers a color, and then I made a map of the pond and here's the different blocks of the flowers. So the pink ones are the clover, the, um, the, the green is the plantain, so on and so forth. The blue is the chicory. And then I tallied up how many flowers there were and then got a total and then found out what percent each of the flowers were of this thing. And then I made a pie chart with those percents. Um, so that was really fun. I don't really like math in school, but math like this is really great. Um, so. Um, this is kind of a little bit inspired by this one, this one man named Jonathan Kingdon, who is a biologist 
is so cool if you ever want to like geek out on crazy evolutionary biology. Look up Jonathan Kingdon. He's amazing. Um, and he kind of has maps like this of the color-coded maps for flowers and stuff like that. So I like to call these Jonathan Kingdon maps. Um, but yeah, so those are kind of the end of my journal pages. So I just kind of wanted to close by saying um, journaling has taught me to really intentionally look for mysteries in everything. Um, and when I'm tuned into mysteries, they will show up. There's kind of a phrase that goes around in the journaling community of when you show up for nature, she'll show up for you. Um, so if you, if you go out specifically looking for mysteries, mysteries will appear, you will find, you will find cool things to draw. And for a while, I kind of thought I'd seen it all in my backyard. I was kind of like, well, I've journaled all the plants in my backyard. I've seen all the birds. Like, I'm done. You know, I need to go somewhere else. And then I kind of realized that, no, there's still, there's still things in my backyard that I can still be wondering about that are still interesting that I'm still putting wow boxes in front of because I'm so excited about these things I've been seeing for years. And it's just, so if I had any advice for anyone who is starting to journal or wants to ask questions is to go out and look for things that make you say, huh, that's cool. I love that, that's so fun. And once you get that little, huh, that's funny, draw it, write questions about it, and do, do all of that, and trust me, it will be so fun. So thank you guys so much. So now I'd like to invite up my friend, mentor, sketching buddy, wonderful person, John Muir Lotz. So thank you. Thank you, Fiona. Mm -hmm. um, I was just uh, looking up there on the, the, the screen on the far left-hand side. You can see what we call the metadata. Um, that is a place where you know, you're putting the location, the weather, the, the time, the, all the sort of details that you don't know what's going to be significant down the line. Um, and I love how it's a rainy day, and you've described it as perfect. <laughs> <laughs> that says a lot. I've been taking notes in my journal um, because I want to, to uh, remember the things that you're, you're, you're talking about. So here's my, my notes of Fiona's presentation. Um, and, but there, there's a few threads that you, you touched on that I mm -hmm. wanted to, to follow up on a little bit more. Um, and the one is that this, this pile, of, of journals, can, do, can you see that in the back? All right. So this is, this is what I find a lot of people, they imagine like, I want to start nature journaling and you kind of imagine yourself after a few years, you get this. And, but what I find is that people go get themselves a journal and then they start journaling and, and sketching and then <laughs> life gets in the way and they stop. And um, I, I know that for me, that, like, that kind of happens with lots of things. But this, this kept going. Um, and I wanted to ask you about what goes on. You, you, part of it is, is you have fun doing it. Mm -hmm. But, but yes. what else is going on that helps you to keep going? How do you do that? Um, and, and not have, you know, like sometimes you know, we feel like you know, our, our gas tank starts to get low. Mm -hmm. You've, you're, you're acting, you're in, you've just started high school. Right. So you're also busy. Um, so how, how, do you, how do you do that? You actually, um, I'm supposed to be your nature journaling mentor, but you're journaling more than me, <laughs> right? So um, in that time, I've got two journals. So what, what are you doing that keeps you going? Um, so it's mainly that I really try to get out every single day. And I, I mentioned this, that I try, I try to go for a walk every day. Hmm. And I really, I like, I'll, I'll be like, all right, I haven't journaled today. So I'm going to take my journal out and I'm going to sit down and I'm, and I, and I'm going to journal. And 
I, I, I've, I've realized that even if I like, quote, force myself to do it, I still find cool things to see. I, I still find cool things to draw. So just go out and do it. <laughs> um, so, and, and again, it doesn't have to take time. Um, it, it, you know, it, only, it can only literally take 10 minutes. Um, but just go out and do it. That would be my piece of advice for this. <laughs> is to, th this comes from saying, you know, I haven't journaled today, so I'm going to go out and journal. So yeah, that's kind of my, my philosophy for a stack of 16 journals. It seems to have worked. It seems to have worked, um, one would think. So, and, and then for, also for a, a lot of us, when we start to, you, you put your pencil down on paper and you're looking at you know, that bird and you go, this does not look like that bird. And a lot of us, when we kind of get when we see that this doesn't look like that, we go, forget it, I can't do it. You, you talked about the little man, the mm -hmm. little art critic who yes. goes like, well, this is not the Leslie Le Bon thing. <laughs> yes. There is no bun thing here, right? Yes. And so yes. Um, you said that, that, that the critic shows up less for you. Um, does it still show up? And how do, how do you handle that if, how do you, are those voices just gone for you when you're journaling, or, mm -hmm. or how do you handle it when, uh, if those things show up when they do? They pretty much don't in journaling. They pretty much don't. Um, every now and again, if I start getting wrapped up in the eye of a bird or something like that, they'll be like, no, no, that's not quite right. No, no, no. And I'll be like, no, it's not about that. Stop talking. We're not doing that right now. Um, and so that's, that's basically, I, but it, it very rarely happens. It's very rare. It's usually when I've had a sketch in the field and I'm coming home and I'm painting it at my house that the art starts to creep in and my self-critic is saying, hey, hey, no, you're not supposed to do that. Um, so it's, it's usually that, but it's, it's very rare that I have a self-critic that comes okay. in. Okay, so you're saying that it's, it's not about that. What would you say it is about? It's, it's about the process. Um, and it's about getting your interpretation of the bird. If it doesn't look like exactly like the bird, that's okay. It's your interpretation. And the more you draw like the, the more you draw, the better you will eventually get. And so it's just just keep doing it. Just keep doing it. Um, and yeah, yeah. It's it's your representation. It's not hmm. it's not exact copy of the bird. It won't be the exact copy of the bird. So Accept that right. and, and, and enjoy it. I like that. Um, as you've been uh, developing your, your systems and, and, and skills, have there been any kind of key um, realizations or kind of breakthrough ideas for you that I'm, I'm especially thinking of things that are that might be portable to 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 other people, other people who are journaling mm -hmm. in the room. Things where like you know, gosh, I wish I got the memo on that earlier. <laughs> um, things that yeah. you found once you had this some this other system going, it really brought you to a higher level. Definitely map making, definitely diagramming stuff like that. Stuff like this um, was a huge breakthrough because I thought it was just draw a picture, write about it, you know? It, it, I had it, it hadn't occurred to me that you could draw in this way, and there's, you, you, you can't like mess this up because it's kind of out of your imagination in a way. I wasn't in a drone hovering above the pond doing exact little lines of where the flowers were. That was just my imagination of were I to be in a drone. So this is another cool way for people to, who want to start journaling, who are scared about not drawing right, is to start by diagramming. Start by drawing maps of things. And that was a huge breakthrough for me of that. And also, just a random one, is learning the difference between how and why. Um, because I would ask questions with why, and I realized they were actually how questions. So like, why does this do this, as opposed to how does this do this? And learning the difference between those was really key to me. I really, that was really cool. So yeah, that's, that's kind of my, Th th those are my two like main huge breakthroughs that I was like, whoa, I wish I'd gotten the memo about this before. <laughs> um, so. Well, that, th we're, we're talking about those, those, those questions. Mm -hmm. um, also kind of pulls me into my, my, my next thought, which is that in just, you know, there's, there's this blossoming of question marks all over yes. the page. And I love yes. the little 
um, the, the, the question doodle mark yes. there. Um, so I write questions in my journals. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to just kind of open to a random page. And this one has no questions on it. Um, <laughs> and this one has, ah, oh, hey, is it turning eggs? <laughs> All right, um, one question on a page. But, but, but you're, you're taking this curiosity thing to a different level. I'd say that it's, it's a major part of your game. Of all the, 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 the naturalists that I know, of all the journalers that I know, you are um, actually the best at generating questions. And I was wondering if you could unpack for us a little bit about your personal, um, your personal curiosity process. What, what sort of, what is it, it feels, what does it feel like? What motivates it? What kind of goes on for you? Um, and are there any strategies that you have that you find that, um, I, I, and tomorrow I'm gonna be, I'm gonna be teaching a group of second graders I want to teach them how to ask questions. This is actually what I'm doing tomorrow. I'm teaching second graders how to ask questions. So how, what, what would you suggest would be some strategies I could use to kind of get them more towards this? Yeah. Um, so usually what I'll do is I'll start with an observation. So if you see up there by the yellow thistle, I have an exclamation mark of an observation that I made. And then off of almost every observation, I ask why. Um, because it's just a great question to ask. And then I come up with like multiple hypotheses and then they just lead to question upon question upon question upon question. And usually I'll start with the very, very basic questions and they will eventually get into more interesting questions the, the more you ask. So if you're looking at something and you're like, well, I don't really have any interesting questions, so I guess I just won't ask questions. Mm -hmm. Don't, don't do that. Ask the simple questions that you think are silly. Like, why would I ask that? Like, that's, that's not an interesting question. No, ask it, because it will lead to more fascinating questions, more interesting questions um, in the end. So that's, that's kind of my process, is start with an observation, ask why, and then ask the basic questions, and they will eventually get to more interesting questions. So that's, that's kind of my process Do you think it, it makes a difference that you're writing it down? Yes, very much, very much. Because you, you can see where I went. Like you can basically see my thought process on paper. Mm -hmm. So you can see mm -hmm. the little arrows between the questions. That's like where my thoughts went. You, you can basically track how I thought, and that's kind of really cool to see. So. Yeah, there's this, um, in, this has kind of an interesting parallel to um, the idea, whole idea of metacognition, which is thinking about how you're thinking. So all the people who, in educational theory, they tell us that you know, we're supposed to th think about how we're thinking and then we'll be better at thinking. Um, <laughs> but the only problem is that it's impossible to do. Right. Because the minute you start thinking about what you're thinking about, you're not thinking about what you were thinking about, you're thinking about thinking about what you were thinking about. <laughs> right. Right? Yes. Um, but, but here, you can actually... When I see, this is, this is a map of your on the ground thinking, and that then allows you to think about what you're thinking about. Right. <laughs> yes. This is, Love this it. is what, so this is, this is what metacognition looks like. I love the, also the kind of the, the arrows. You can really mm -hmm. follow these, these chains of curiosity. Um, are there any stories that you have about, uh, what, what is one of the, the most kind of uh, addictive questions that you got onto that led you in one of the strangest directions? In one of the strangest directions? Um, I don't really know. That's a really good question. Um, <laughs> speaking of questions, um, I've, I've been looking at a spider and just kind of thinking about, oh, what species is it? And then kind of, it, it was a funnel spider, so it had like this whole web complex with like this little hole in the back, and it was in the little hole. And, um, and I, I was looking at it, and I was thinking, gosh, it really looks like a crab. Its little like feet have like hairs on it. It really looks like a crab. And so then I started wondering about evolution and if spiders and crabs had anything in common, and like did they 
were, were they a similar species and one went to the water and one didn't? And like, how did that work? I'm not sure if I'm right. I don't really mind if I'm not. But um, I, that's kind of a weird one that I was just looking at a funnel spider and asked some basic questions and then was like, huh, that's funny. It's all of a sudden I'm thinking about evolution and stuff like that. So that was kind of an odd one that went all over everywhere. Hmm. But well, what, what about this whole idea of asking more questions than you can answer? Um, a, I'm, I find that a lot of people are, are uncomfortable in that sort of with ambiguity. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that we like things when, they're, when things are kind of the answers are, are, are there for us. Um, you're saying that, that giving up on that idea was very freeing for you. I was wondering if you could unpack that a little bit more for yes. us. Yes. Realizing that it's, it's not about the answers, just like it's not about the pretty pictures. It's not about the answers either. And if you, if you let go the idea that you have to answer all your questions, you can just ask and ask and ask and ask and ask. And there's no end to the questions you allow yourself to ask because you don't have to go in and answer them all. So it's, it's just really fun. And you can ask questions that you can't find the answer to on a Google search. You know, you, there's, there's questions in my journals that um, you, you can't just automatically find the answer to. And so I, I think it's, hmm. again, it's just super freeing to be able to say, no answers this time, <laughs> just ask the questions. Uh, so yeah, just, just to ask and ask and ask and ask and don't worry about the answers right now. You don't need to worry about any of that. So that's, that's what I do with that kind of stuff. I like that. Um, just to kind of tie a couple of threads together, mm -hmm. you're, 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 go you're going crazy on questions. Yes. And you also said that when you're doing this, um, your inner critic is turning off. Mm. Um, there is um, some kind of cool research on curiosity that shows that when your brain is in an aroused state of curiosity, you get a, a flood of dopamine neurotransmitters. Yes. And those are like your happy chemicals. And so that feeling that you have when you're curious about something is actually a dopamine-mediated response. And those neurotransmitters um, are also connected into flow states. When, when you're out, when you're doing this, here, here's, I guess, a question. Are you ever out doing this and you kind of feel like you totally lose track of time and whether you're cold or hungry mm -hmm. and those sorts of things? Yes. All right, yes. so that's... If, all the if, time. Is that all the time? Mm-hmm. All right, mm -hmm. so then you're kind of, so you're getting into what biologists call a flow state in doing this. And when you do that, it turns out that the part of your brain that also has your inner critic in it, your dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the, um, it gets less blood flow to it. Mm -hmm. All right, so we now have done fMRIs of people in flow states, and that part of your brain here and over here is going and getting out of your way. Making that noise. Yeah, I think yes. if you listen for it. <laughs> Making that noise. Yes. Yeah. This is nice. Yeah. Um, so you've been, anything that you practice, I can, I can see as I look through these journals, it's very clear to me that your ability to ask questions has radically improved. Your ability to use other systems, mapping, to use the measurements and numbers, um, to get this balance of drawings and, and writing, um, has all those things have improved and I would expect it to, because that's what all the science shows us. You practice something, you get better at it. But I also, I wanted to ask if there were any, as you've been doing this, kind of any subtle or unexpected gifts of journaling that have kind of come along as a sidecar as you've been doing this. You've been, you know, working on the, you're out there, you're drawing spiders in your backyard. Um, are there, have you found that this has trained you in, in other ways to, so you can use those neural networks that you're making and sort of repurpose them for other sorts of mm -hmm. things? Are there any kind of hidden gifts of nature journaling that you've gotten out of this practice? Yeah. Um, a lot of it is to, to ask more questions about things in general and not worry about answers to things in general. So not just spiders in my backyard, 
not just flowers, um, but other things too. So I've, it's kind of taught me to freely ask questions about anything and everything that I run into and to not worry about the answers in any of those. Uh, so that's, that's kind of the main one. And also to notice more about things, to really, to really look, you know, to really, there, there's a difference between looking and seeing as well. Uh, you, you can look at something, but you don't necessarily see it. And when you've trained yourself to look for interesting things, when, nature, when you show up for nature, she'll show up for you. Basically, when you look for something, you, you will see things. And so that's, that's kind of something that I've also taken away from it, is looking more deeply at things, and not just physical things, but also like looking into situations as well. So, yeah. Hmm. Are there any, um, at, any kind of new frontiers that you are, um, as you kind of, no, you've just finished a new journal. Yes, All just right. today. Um, what aspects of nature journaling um, are the most interesting to you, the most exciting to you, both in terms of subject matter and in terms of, of skills or processes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, with the diagramming, I love doing diagrams and maps. That's something mm -hmm. I just love so much. And also for subject matter, in the wintertime, we have a ton of mushrooms around our house. So like this whole next season is going to be journals full of mushrooms. Um, so that's kind of fun to get into that state of mind of thinking about mushrooms and all of that. And uh, yeah, so again with the diagramming, again with the questions, those are kind of my two things that I really love a lot. So for journaling especially. That, 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 that's really different than a lot of the when I, first, when I first started nature journaling and, and mm -hmm. kind of looking at journaling, I thought it was supposed to be, like I'd, I'd seen like the country diary of an Edwardian lady, have you seen that yes. book? Where it's like, here's a pretty painting of a flower next to some pretty script about it. And that I thought that what I was supposed to do is I was supposed to sit down and make a pretty portrait of something. Right. The, the idea of the diagrams where it's not about that picture, it's mm -hmm. about noticing something, sort of seeing that structure. Um, I like that, and I also like your emphasis on those, those questions. That's, um, I think those are also things that for me make it a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nobody's got a crystal ball, mm -hmm. but um, if you were to sort of think about the trajectory which, um, I understand that, that doing this has sort of kind of opened a lot of doors for you. Mm -hmm. Um, if you were to take a stab at the sorts of possibilities that you sort of see for yourself, say 10 years from now, mm -hmm. um, and what, what, what areas in this world are the most exciting for you? How do you, would, might you see yourself kind of engaging with this, or do you, I should mm -hmm. say? I don't want to put those words into your mouth. I'm hoping that you would, but yes. the, um, <laughs> the, what are, some of those possibilities looking like? And are any of those things that have, are things that have been kind of mediated by your experience in journaling? Yeah, um, I definitely want to guide more, take people on bird walks, journaling walks, so on and so forth like that, um, and, and work with homeschool kids, work with adults, work with um, pr pretty much everybody, um, guiding them on walks. I, I really want to start doing that more and a little bit more of nature education and journal education and stuff like that. So that's kind of what I see myself maybe doing with, with this, um, is to keep doing it and keep having fun and keep finding new mysteries in my backyard and also teaching others about how fun this can be. So, yeah. I think the world needs that. <laughs> um, I, I do want to say that in my experience as an educator, um, I have had uh, no more rewarding experience than working with you on this process of, of nature journaling. I'm really honored to be up here with you today because I see you as somebody that a whole bunch of your, that you talked about the phonograph, a bunch of those sort of the, the, the skills of nature journaling. Uh, there, there are things that you are innovating 
and I'm really excited to see how you're going to continue on it. And I wanted to personally thank you for, for, for what you're doing. And should you decide that education and environmental um, stewardship and connecting people with nature is something that you want to be doing, uh, you'd be an amazing, um, an amazing educator at that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fiona. Thank you.